you'll have to forgive me for not having a camera on at this moment. I have one. It's a little shitty web camera, but I don't know how to mess with any of the filters or anything like that. So I'm not going to subject you to whatever it is, whatever you're going to see if I, if I turn it on. Godfather by Mario Puzo, published in 1969. This book was huge when it came out. It was on the New York Times bestseller list for 67 weeks and sold over 9 million copies in two years. Published in 1969, it became the best-selling published work in history for several years. Rip that from Wikipedia directly. You'll probably recognize the name mostly from the movie trilogy, but the book was huge when it came out. People loved or hated it. The Mafia, or at least some key members in the Mafia, hated it, and at this time not a lot of people knew what the Mafia was or if they even existed, and this book kind of fed the legend, which helped boost sales, and so on and so forth. I first encountered this book, oof, I don't know, when I was 17, maybe older, I'm not really sure, but my father bought it for me. We were at some book reseller, or Half Price Books, I think is what it was called is what it was called and he came up to me and he's he asked me if I ever read this I think we had seen the movie at the time because I think it was one of my favorite movies or whatever he he's really into this movie and the book and I was so surprised by this he's never suggested me to read anything he hates reading and honestly so do I so it was weird for him to suggest a book to me and I started it a long time ago when I first got it Made it about a third of the way and stopped. I didn't understand it. had too many characters. The writing, you know, wasn't what I was looking for. And so it went on my shelf for a decade or more. And I finally pulled it down and uh, started opening it up and reading it. Just something for an easy video. So I read through the first chapter and it is a doozy. It's 62 pages long. Took me, a, you know, an hour or so to read it. I, I don't remember. But I took a break halfway through because I was just, I was bored. It's very dry. The prose is, is pretty much what you see is what you get. Everything's matter of fact. The boredom came mostly from how close the movie stuck to the book. There were some new things in there, but very few new things. So I, I pretty much knew how the first couple chapters we're gonna be and uh, this is also due to the fact that I have read it before or started it before so I'm not in for a bunch of chapters or a bunch of surprises in the first few chapters but I'm I'm curious to see if the rest of the book will be, will be like that will there be something that I haven't read before or something that will interest me so far I mean in this first chapter chapter they introduced 20 plus characters and goddamn is a lot to take in if I wasn't so familiar with the movies that I'd be lost, and honestly the first time, that's why I quit. I just, I didn't know who I was supposed to focus on. Or it's not that I didn't know how to, who to focus on, there was just a lot going on. Um, and I'm not really sure, rereading it now, I'm not really sure if I like it still. I don't know if it's because I've watched the movie or tried it before, so I'm kind of bored. But there's just, there's not a lot of character yet. And I'm 60 pages in. It's not like I read the first five-page chapter and I'm wondering if it's going to get any better. But I'll give it some more time. I'm going to finish it either way. There's just so much information and so many characters. I'm not sure what is pertinent to the overall story. What do I focus on, right? Who do I focus on? And as the story goes on, you'll I'll understand who to focus on. But what do I do with all that extraneous knowledge? If you ask me what his style is or how the story is written, what, what it focuses on, it doesn't focus so much on details. The details aren't the important part, it's the overall picture. So all of these details together form a tapestry, you know, or a, um, I don't know what those isometric paintings are, the Japanese style, or it's on the, uh, on those screens and there's just a bunch of uh you know shit everywhere that that's kind of what this is there's a bunch of shit bunch of characters that are all doing stuff and overall you get the sense of what the story is which i respect in a certain sense but it, it it's taking me a minute to get used to to that kind of uh speed as for the story itself it opens on three people with unique problems 
A baker named Nazarene has a daughter who works in his bakery, and an Italian prisoner of war, this is during 1945, the war has just ended, so an Italian prisoner of war on parole is uh, working and helping uh, Nazarene out in the bakery. Well, it turns out his daughter and this man have fallen in love, and now that the war is over, Enzo, the Italian boy, will be repatriated back to his country, meaning basically they're going to deport him. Because the two have fallen in love, now maybe not fallen in love isn't the right word, but Nazarene is afraid that Enzo has gotten his daughter pregnant and is now leaving, so you know he wants him to stay in the country. Nazarene needs Don Corleone's help to keep the boy in the country. Johnny Fontaine is another character, a singer going downhill fast. His career is kind of over. Maybe not over, but stalling, and he's going downhill. His life is a mess. He married, he left his wife and kids and married some famous actress, and it turns out that she has a very different idea of life than he does, and he doesn't necessarily agree with it. And a big-time producer has vowed to destroy his career, won't give him this movie part that he needs, his singing voice, is, he's losing his singing voice. And uh, Don Corleone is his actual godfather, so he goes to him to figure to help him figure his shit out. I don't know how to say his name. And Amerigo, Amerigo Bonacera, an Italian immigrant who believes in the American system, his daughter was going out with this boy, and he and another boy took her to some place and tried to take advantage of her, and when she refused, they beat her uh, pretty violently. Um, but in the trial, they were given a suspended sentence and went free that day. So he vows justice for himself and his daughters and seeks Don Corleone to help him out with that. After that, we go to we move to the wedding where we, we are introduced to the Don himself. During the festivities, a lot of things happen. But most importantly, the Don sees some of his guests who have issues they need resolved. More than just those three characters. We are then introduced to his eldest son, Sonny the hot-headed eldest brother or eldest son of Don Corleone. And during the wedding, he has an affair or an encounter with a young woman named Lucy. They, Lucy is uh, Connie Corleone's maid of honor. And Connie Corleone is, of course, Don Corleone's daughter, and she's the one getting married. Well, Lucy slips away with, with Sonny, and they do the dirty. We also hear about the middle son, Fredo, briefly. Kind-hearted, but weak. We are introduced to Michael Corleone as well and his girlfriend, an American named Kay Adams. We learn that he is a war hero. He was also his father, his father's favorite son before he left for the war. He left for the war against his father's wishes. And uh, before that, he was rumored to, to take over the business someday. Uh, he is also the youngest son. We also learn that the family doesn't care too much for Kay Adams. We hear stories from Michael about his father's business and some of his business quote-unquote tactics. We hear a story about Luca Brasi and how dangerous and scary he is. Meanwhile, in the Don's office, he meets with the people who need his help, and we are shown that he is gracious, stern, and always comes through with his promise. But you have to give him your friendship, which means eventually you're going to owe him a favor. He says the time that, that time may never come. We meet Tom Hagen, the Don's advisor. They took him in when he was 12, homeless, and sick. Now he is a lawyer to the family. Some other things that happen at the wedding. The FBI takes the plates of some of the cars. Carlo Rizzi, the groom to Connie Corleone, eyes his wife's purse for the gift money she's receiving. He takes it later after... Uh, he takes it from her later after abusing her. And it sets up their relationship. Johnny Fontaine comes through and sings for the crowd of people. He arrives late, late at the wedding. We go into Don Corleone's office again. We learn of his troubles. Don Corleone chastises Johnny for messing up his life tells him to act like a man. We learn there has been tension in the past between them as Johnny refused to take his advice before. We also learn that Jack Waltz is a big time producer who has it out for Johnny Fontaine and Johnny doubts his godfather because Jack Waltz has so much power. We are then introduced to Luca Brasi, a stone cold killer under the employee of the Don. More important things from this chapter, two men were introduced to Polly, one of the low level gangsters. He employs two thugs to beat up the two, uh, the two guys who beat up Amerigo's daughter. All of the sons go to see Jinko Abandando, the Don's first advisor, who is dying of cancer in the hospital. Once there, a delirious Abandando begs the Don to save him from death. 
When the Don says that he cannot do this, Abandando asks him to stay by his side so that maybe God will be too afraid to take his soul when he dies. Tom Hagen goes to see Jack Waltz to convince him to change his mind. They talk a couple of times and Jack Waltz refuses to negotiate, which prompts Tom Hagen to return home to inform the Don. And the last note here, we hear of a deal with a man named Solazzo. We know nothing more, but it is inferred that he's a dangerous man and that it could bring danger if the situation is not handled properly. So that's chapter one. I'm curious to see what will happen in the future, and I expect to be reading more of this. Maybe I'll do this once a week. I don't know. It depends how easy these videos are to make. I have another video that I'm trying to make for YouTube, which uh, I thought would be easier than it was, but it's turning out to be a real son of a bitch. I did this video instead. I'm also brainstorming ideas for a series I want to re release bi-weekly on YouTube and Patreon, but that's a couple weeks before I can do anything for it. Speaking of which, I have a Patreon, if you want to go check that out. I have some things on there, I think in total like 10 posts. It's free to join for the foreseeable future until I can, until I have enough material on there to justify charging for it. So give it a try, it's free. I'm trying to post twice a week there, whether it be something really small or something more significant, but this is all new for me, so I don't know where this is going to go or what's going to happen. So check the Patreon out for more stuff, subscribe, like, and I'll see you in the next one.